So we've talked about one implementation of the dictionary abstract data type, binary search trees and self-balancing binary search trees. Now we're going to talk about something very different, which has quite different pros and cons compared to the search tree implementations. We're going to talk about hashing, hash tables. A hash table is basically an array with some extra features. So it's a very simple data structure. We have an array in which we store the items. Now ideally we could just store every item in our database in its own array slot. If I wanted to find an element I could somehow take the element quickly calculate its address and just go and extract it. And if we do that right, that should be a constant time operation and very quick in practice. Of course, you might be thinking, how do we quickly calculate its address? For example, you may have a huge record, which is representing a person, customer of a bank, something like that. You have a lot of different attributes, their name, address, phone number, etc., password. How can you easily find the address of something in the table based on that? So what you need is some kind of a simple function which, if this is the set of all possible objects, and the objects are here, like this, sitting inside this universal set of objects, I need to have some kind of function, let's call it say h, it's going to be the hash function, which finds the address of an element. Now how's it going to do that? It needs to be quick, so it's not likely to look at the entire record. That's quite a lot of work even just to inspect everything in that record. Typically what it will do is it will choose only a part of the record. Maybe it'll be something like some sort of key that we used in the case of sorting. So instead of the whole record, it might only be the password or the phone number, something like that. And then even that might be too much. So what we really want to do is start with a little piece of information inside our record, calculate from that an integer, a non-negative integer, which gives the index into the array. So this would be the ideal thing. Every record has a different index and they're all stored in the array. And it's easy to calculate the index by some simple formula. But of course, that could be quite difficult. How do you know that your formula is going to be one-to-one? -one? Well, one thing you could do, for example, is have a list of possible phone numbers, which are up to, say, 10 digits or a bit more. They correspond to positive integers, because they are positive integers, these phone numbers. And just take the value to be the actual phone number and stick it in the array, so that your phone number gives your index into the array. There are a couple of problems. You could have two customers with the same phone number. So maybe you try to use a unique identifier, like a US social security number or something like that. That could be done. However, there's a big problem in that often the set of possible keys or records is enormous. You could have potentially everyone on the world as a customer. Maybe in a few hundred years you could have the galactic bank. You could have a much larger universe or galaxy of potential customers. And that would require you then to have an array the size of the universe of possible keys or records. That's too much space to be using a lot of the time, especially if you only have a small fraction of them actually being used. So really, you might only have a million customers and there are trillions of possible customers and you have to allocate a huge amount of space for them. You may not even know who they all are. In fact, this could be quite difficult. So ideally, the space you're allocating should be not much bigger, in fact, than the 
actual number of customers you have. You may need to resize occasionally when you get particularly successful. You might have a little bit of time where you maybe double the size of the array, copy everything over. That shouldn't happen that often. So basically, we want to have an array. We want to have a simple function that gives an array index. But we don't want this array to be too big. And it should be much smaller, in fact, than this possible universe here. So immediately, we see some problems. One of them is that if this is a much bigger set here than this, it's very unlikely this function will be one to one. There will be possible elements of your set, possible customers, who will hash to the same place. And so you are going to end up with what are called collisions, right? You are going to have two records, say k and k primed, which are different, but their hash values are the same. That's going to be inevitable if we're going to use hashing for any reasonable application. And in some sense, all the theory of hashing is to try to work out how to arrange things so that we minimize the trouble that is caused by collisions. Because they are inevitable, but there are ways of dealing with them which are better than other ways of dealing with them. That's what we're going to be talking about. What we're going to need is what's called a collision resolution policy. It's a way of dealing with collisions when they occur. What do you do? And what happens in practice is there are two different ways to do it. One of them uses extra space in case we have a collision. The other one doesn't. It stores everything in the original table, but it moves elements around. Now, there's many ways you could do this. For the purposes of what we're doing here, I only want to talk about, let's say, first come, first served idea. That means. If I have an element that's already in the table, and then I get another element that hashes to the same place, the second one has to move. The one that's already there just stays there, and the second one has to do something, because they can't both go in that same spot. So we're going to assume that. And as I said, there are two different ways of dealing with this. One is what's called open addressing. Open addressing is where an element comes in, collides with another one, and then it finds another spot in the table by some rule, somehow. Everything is inside the table. We don't need extra space. The other method is what's called chaining. In chaining, what you do is you first stick an element here, but then if something comes and collides with it, you have a little linked list associated with that array index, and you push elements into the linked list. Okay, so we stick an element there. Right. Those are the two main types of methods for collision resolution, two main policies. We still have to describe exactly how things move in the open addressing case when they try to find an extra space. Open addressing and chaining are the two methods that we're going to focus on here. Hashing has a lot of applications. Not only is it useful for implementing a dictionary abstract data type, in which we want to insert, delete, and find elements, it has a lot of other applications. It's useful for finding duplicates. It's useful for storing passwords. Uh, it's useful in cryptography. If you have a look online, try and find out some applications of hashing. You'll find that there are a lot of very interesting ones. It would be really worth you having a look at that. It's a really important technique to understand. Now, there are certain desirable properties that we want hash functions to satisfy. One of them is that they're quick to calculate. I don't want to spend a long time processing my record to work out where to look for it, where its index is. I want my lookups to be fast. So that's the first one. 
The second thing is we should try to avoid collisions as much as we can. So the idea is that if you have records that are close to each other, instead of hashing to quite similar places, they should be spread out almost randomly. In fact, ideally, a hash function spreads elements around randomly in some sense, except the big problem is that we require that a hash function not be random. Hash functions have to be deterministic. Why is that? It's because otherwise you wouldn't be able to use them for lookups. If I have a hash function and it gives a random address and then I try it again and get a different random address, I can't find the element. So what I need is a deterministic, repeatable way of calculating the address of an element. But I want that function to behave in such a way that the output looks random in some way. And this sounds very difficult, but actually it's not so bad. If you think about random number generators used in computers, for example, most of them, almost all of them, are in fact deterministic. They're not based on hardware in some way. They're based on some algorithm and it produces a sequence of numbers which look kind of random in the sense that if you do classic statistical tests on them, you know, they pass. You can measure whether the output is consistent according to these statistical tests with, say, a uniformly uh, distributed random variable on some interval. We want them to be simple, as we said, so there is some tension between these various requirements, but it is possible to come up with quite good hash functions without that much effort. I'm not going to talk about specific ones in great detail today. That's an interesting thing you could look up as well. What are the real-life hash functions that are used in important programming languages? Just a note, the word hash comes from a cooking analogy. You might have heard of hash browns. The idea is you throw things on a grill and you shovel them all around, and then things that were close together get moved very far apart, and it's almost random looking at the end. That's the idea of how a hash function works. So just to finish this part off, chaining is straightforward. You just insert at the head of the list constant time. How do we do insertion and open addressing? That's more tricky. You have a collision where an element comes in to an already occupied slot, and then you need some way of knowing where to go. So there are some very basic ideas. The first simplest idea that was used, I think, is called linear probing, where you just go, for example, to the left, one slot, and if it's a space, you go in there. If not, you keep going. You wrap around, and eventually you find a space, and you move there. Notice that if I want to find the element, having inserted it, I just have to reproduce those steps. I say, well, here's my element, here's my hash function, it should be there, oh, it's not. Therefore, I keep probing until I find it. There's another way of dealing with it, called double hashing. And in that case, instead of moving one element at a time and probing in that way, I come into this point and then I have a separate hash function, let's say g, a separate function which basically operates on the, the key and gives another number in here, which is the offset amount. Instead of the offset always being 1 and me probing to the left by 1, the offset amount, the amount I jump by, will actually look kind of random. It will depend on the actual original record and well, where it hashes, usually. So I jump to the left, let's say this one might jump to the left by 3. The value of my offset function, my second hash function, might be 3. And so I would go around there and I'd, in this case, end up in the same place I did with the previous method. But in general, they'll be quite different. Those are two of the main ways 
to resolve collisions using open addressing. There are others. It's quite a complicated subject hashing, but we're going to keep it at that for now. Right, so now that we understand what hashing is and the mechanics of it, we want to try and analyze it. And what we're going to do is first think about what the basic elementary operation is that we're going to use for measuring runtime. We're going to measure what are called probes. A probe is just an access to an array element. So we have your hash table. The initial calculation of the hash function and looking at that element and inserting something in it, that's a single probe. And if I'm doing collision resolution in open addressing, every time I probe, as I mentioned before, every time I go to try and find an unoccupied slot, that counts as a probe, obviously. When we're doing chaining, I don't need to access different array elements. I just insert. Just insert. So it's not just an array element. It's actually a list element, a linked list. So every time I have to go down the linked list to try and find something, that counts as a probe. Now one key thing we can notice is that when we search for an element, we actually retrace the insertion process. We get the hash function, we go into where it should be, and then we move around either down a chain or around inside the table, and we follow the same process that was followed in order to insert it, in order to find a place to insert it. So that means that if I search for a particular element, it's the same amount of work as I originally took to insert it. That means the average search time for a randomly chosen element is the average of all the insertion times that it took when we built the table starting from empty and inserting everything in. Let's assume we're not deleting anything at this stage. So the analysis is relatively easy. We only really have to look at insertion and we also get the search costs for free. Let's ignore deletion just for now. Now, obviously, in order to do the analysis, we need some kind of model of the data. Remember, for sorting, we had the idea of randomly selected data, or sometimes we looked at the worst case input. The worst case for hashing is always bad. With any hash function, you can always find data that will hash to the same spot and yet are different themselves. And you can just have a huge number of these, in fact. You can usually arrange it so that every single data item, if you're being malicious, always hashes to the same spot. That's the largest amount of work you're going to have to do, the most collisions to resolve, because the second one, has, let's say an open addressing, has to move. Then the third one will follow exactly the same procedure as that and move to its new spot. Then the fourth one will bang into all these others until it finally inserts. You do a lot of work. And in the worst case, you might need to do order n work, where n is the size of the table. n is the number of items in the table. n is the number of items. m is number of slots or space of the table. So N for November is the number of data items you have at a given time. M is fixed most of the time until you have to rehash. And M is the number of slots, M for Mike. Now there's an important quantity associated with these. Lambda, which is N for November divided by M for Mike. It's called the load factor. And the load factor is the average number of items per slot. In the case of open addressing, it has to be less than or equal to one because you can't have more than one item in a slot. In the case of chaining, it could be anything large because you could have huge chains here. Right? Just notice that when we have chaining, we could make sure that everything hashes to the same slot 
and then all the data would be in some huge chain. Then if you wanted to find an element, you might have to go all the way down that chain, order n time in order to find it. We don't want order n lookup. That's a complete waste. Okay, if we're going to do that, we might as well just use a list implementation. Very simple one without all the overhead of the hash function. So worst case is bad. We know that. What we're interested in is what's going to happen in average, just like we were with quick sort versus merge sort. Quick sort was not competitive with merge sort in the worst case, but it is an average. For random data that's non-maliciously given to you, you've got a good chance of having better performance with quick sort. What we want actually is to achieve very fast lookup in particular and insertion and even deletion, which I'm ignoring for now. We want order one, in fact. We were getting worst case order log n for binary search trees. We're going to get worst case order n here. But what we're hoping is that the average case for nice random data for hash tables is actually better. It's even order one. And in fact, we can achieve that. So here we are at the questions again. I've got three for you. First one, why would double hashing, which is used more in practice than linear probing, be better in your view? Why do you think, what's the idea behind it that makes it better? Better should mean that we get faster overall performance in general for the three basic operations. Second question, how are we going to analyze hashing? What are the elementary operations going to be? This is a key issue, all right? And how are we going to work out how long they take? How are we going to estimate the length of time of hashing algorithms? It's pretty clear that when you insert the first element, it's very easy. There's no collision. When you insert more and more elements, it should take longer and longer to insert in the case of open addressing, for example. And it will probably take longer and longer to find elements as the table fills up. When is it too full? When might we need to rehash, get a bit more extra space? These are important questions and we need to address them quantitatively. So this is going to be the subject of the next lecture. Think about this and see what you can come up with. At least try and work out how you think we should measure the running time. What's the basic elementary operation we should use? And related to this is how can we estimate how often collisions occur? How big a problem are they? Obviously, if you have a really, really, really large number of data items and you try and hash them into a small table, you're going to get some collisions. But if you have, say, half a full table, how likely is it you're going to get a collision? We need to understand this. That'll be something we can do once we've answered the previous question and we've got some idea how we're going to measure the running time here. Okay, think hard about these and I'll see you next time.